way. And in case you're wondering what the, the I, I'm not Santa Claus in my red outfit. This is the uniform of the uh, Royal uh, House uh, of Windsor, the late Queen Elizabeth, who passed away, now succeeded by King Charles, King Charles III. And this, if you can see it, is the scarlet uniform that, and the fancy collar and cuffs that we wear um, when we're on duty. Um, my day job is uh, as a judge. Um, so during the day, I'm dealing with um, people who um, have problems, one kind or another. Um, but when I'm not doing that, my job is to take part in ceremonies um, around the uh, royal family. And what we're going to talk about a little uh, today was my role in relation to the sad ceremonies that surrounded the passing of our Queen Elizabeth II, who died here in Scotland. And because of that, the Scottish uh, officers uh, were involved in part of the ceremony which took part in Edinburgh. And thereafter, we travelled as a unit to London where we took place, took part in the main funeral, which took part, sorry, which happened in Westminster Abbey, the uh, one of the largest churches in the United Kingdom. And it's the church where the kings and queens uh, of England and then latterly of Great Britain were always crowned. So kings and queens start their journey as that, that they're, they're made into the king, they're acknowledged as king or queen in a ceremony with a great jeweled crown is put on their head, but they also end their job by a big a great ceremony to, to say goodbye to them before there's then a private ceremony with the family. So these are great state occasions, television, cameras, um, dignitaries from all over the world um, come to say goodbye to people like kings and queens or, or presidents or, or prime ministers, people who hold a, a very large public place in a, in a country's life, it's deemed necessary that their farewells be public. Now, of course, that's in some ways sad because a queen dies, but she's also a mother and a grandmother, and in the case of our uh, dear late queen, a great grandmother. So obviously the family would like uh, to say goodbye uh, for themselves, but because of the nature of having a, a public office, um, of being an important person, the, the, the rest of the country wants to, to be involved and say goodbye. Now, you might wonder if you saw any of the um, ceremonies, they did look, um, though I say it myself, really well organized and everything looked very slick and the soldiers, everyone involved. And there's a very good reason for that. And that is that I'm afraid when you are a person as important as a king or a queen or a, or a president, I'm afraid it's always assumed that you will die and there will have to be these great ceremonies. So what you need to think about is that every six months from the point when a president becomes appointed to a country or a king or a queen gets crowned, from that very minute, they start planning your funeral <laughs> because that is something that has to happen. And so the funeral arrangements for Queen Elizabeth um, were in two parts. If she died in Scotland, it was called Operation Unicorn. And if she died in England, it was called Operation London Bridge. And what people have to do, and this is why it's such an elaborate thing, um, if you imagine the Queen dies in, in, in her country house, it's called Balmoral. Balmoral is a small place in the north of Scotland. You have to get to Edinburgh 
it is about four hours drive to the capital city of Edinburgh. Then there has to be a ceremonies in Edinburgh. After that, though, the Queen has to get to London. And then there are ceremonies in London. So you, you understand the these arrangements have to involve the police because they've got to make sure that all the traffic is out of the way so that the, the um, royal hearse with motorbike riders and all these things can get there without being hindered. Um, getting into Edinburgh. Um, Edinburgh is a city. It's a busy city. I'm sure some of you live in cities. There's a lot of cars. They have to be got out of the way so that the Queen's um, procession can go directly to the places it's got to go. And then once you get to somewhere like Edinburgh and it stops, the people want to come and pay their respects. So again, the police, the emergency services have to set it up so that thousands and thousands of people can stand somewhere, walk in a great, you know, queue to get in to, to see the Queen's coffin, which was um, placed in a church called St Giles. And of course, that takes many hours. So there had to be arrangements for volunteers to, to hand out water and things like that, because because people arrive and don't realise they might have to wait three hours or four hours. And so that is the, 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 the kind of planning that has to be done. Um, in one of the original plans, the Queen's uh, coffin was to go from Edinburgh to London by train. And the reason for that was that the train would move slowly down through Scotland, northern England all the way, and people would be able to stand at railway stations, railway bridges, things like that, and see it going by. And therefore they could say goodbye to the Queen in their own areas. Um, however, despite rehearsing that and having the arrangements in place, when um, Queen Elizabeth actually died, there was so much happening by way of, you know, work on the railways, um, things like that, that they decided, the powers of the B decided that she would have to go by aeroplane. So that plan was changed, in, you know, at the time. Um, you know, meetings were held. No, we can't go by train. So we'll have to do it by, by aeroplane. But do any of you know the first thing that happens when somebody, well, when a king or queen dies? I'll tell you. There's a new king or queen immediately. There's no election. There's no gap. You know, and so as soon as the uh, late queen was pronounced to have passed away to, to her reward uh, in the afterlife, King Charles was uh, proclaimed. So I'm going to try and share. Um, I'm not very good with this, so we shall see how we do. But I'll get the picture up. Um, so there we are. So now. Where's the picture? Now, any idea where I find share screen? Yeah. If you go to the rectangle beside the bright red leave button, don't don't click the leave button. There's right. a rectangle with an arrow on it. Right. Oh, I see it. Yes. Oh, yeah, share. Click. Here, I see. It. You have to understand, yeah. uh, persons. I'm 67. That's the <laughs> old that when I first started work, we didn't have computers. We had typewriters and photocopiers but there we are so share screen okay yeah so and then it will the offer screen. you your microsoft if you if you it go says to screen um, window or tab do i just click the screen yeah if you go to the right hand option i think it will let you select the um slide that you've got well let's see what let's see what we do let's get that up and see now, I've got a picture. I'm going to put it up. Let's see if it works. Hang on. Is that it? Is that it? Share? Yeah. I'm so there's, I'm, oh, yeah. So it, something's happening. So you've oh. shared us. So all you need to do is um, 
stop yes. sharing us right. and um, click on instead the tab that you've got open. Um, so I, it, I stop sharing. Do I press stop sharing? Yes, stop share us. Oh, well done. And it now says share content. Yeah, so share content. Yes. Yeah. So you're looking right. on the top right. Anyone see the picture? It will come. Hang on. I hope. You might have to select um, when you press share. Yes. You will need to select, it will say Microsoft on the top right hand side. Uh, sorry about this. That's OK. Maybe one of our, do you know what? One of our students might be able to tell you better than me. Win-win looks very excited. Win-win, what are we doing wrong? Tell us. OK, so thank you. So first of all, um, uh, could you make me presenter, please, Mrs. Trafford, so it would be easier to show? Um, yes, I thank could. You. Please don't take this over, Win-Win. You see, I'm learning. You see, this is great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. OK, hang on, Win-Win. I'm going to make you a presenter. And you can share your screen and show Sir what to do. Yeah. OK, thank you. So first of all, let me share my screen. Um, so what you did first, Sir, was that um, you went into the meeting like this, so you can see yourself right now. Yes, and then at the first you can press um stop sharing uh but um you can press like uh wait i wish i can see it i wish i can show you like um okay. there was like presentation so when you press um share um so when you press share it has like a presentation thing option and then you, um yeah so and then you can go um through any thing so for example i just shared my screen but I can, um, so you can press window since right. you use windows. And then there's right now there's um, the Cambridge lecture series, general team assembly, mean mode, me, uh, my work, one note and snipping too. So here I can share this because what? I've selected which file I wanted to share. Okay. So uh, here, if you press like share, you uh -huh. can go to windows. Yes. Or I've I've got an idea. Yes. If yes. Not, oh, if you're not seeing the windows, you could you could very quickly if it's a slide, just a couple of images or a PowerPoint, you could send it to me and I'll share it for you if you like. I've got. I've yeah. got uh, they might be quite big. Um, mm. some of them. Let let let's just keep trying. Um, so I've got the share button up here. Uh, yeah. Window. Um, what do I do when I, I press that and it says share contact and I've got screen window or tab, PowerPoint live. Okay. So first of all, um, are you sharing a PowerPoint, sir? No, no, just order. Okay. So you can go and press windows and then you can select which windows of your computer do you want to share. So here there's different windows. Right. And then you and if you press one, it will automatically share the window. Oh, right. So, oh, gosh, share. Hmm. I've now got no contacts, no problem. So, do I snip and sketch or? Copy you can copy? maybe you can press snip and sketch. Um, at first, trying out if we can see your screen, sir. Yeah. I can see the picture I want to show you, but is anyone seeing anything? Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Oh dear. Oh dear. No, we can't see anything. Um, right. Let me you try and do. Maybe uh, take a screenshot, uh, screenshot, and put it into the chat. Oh, perfect. That's clever. Well, wow. Um, yes. Control Command well, Three. Send you the the folder and see if it, it will do it. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll see what it, 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 it may or may not do. Oh, it doesn't seem to say it's too, too bad. Um, 
Let's see. Okay. Hey, it's collecting it all. It's collecting it all. So let's see what we can do. Let's see. Okay. It, says, it says it's collected it. So let's just have a... See, we're learning all sorts of things, children. This oh, is how it could be. You see, we, we learn all the time. And uh, now let's see if it will let me send it to Mrs. Trafford. There we are. Well, well, we'll see if it works and I'll send this to you, Mrs. Trafford, and then we'll take it from, Thank you. from there. Um, now, it's only, it's only a few photographs. It's not, shouldn't kill me yeah. too much. Um, uh, no, I'm not, it's not letting me get you this. That's not good. Um, sorry, Mr. Trafford, could you read me your address and see if I can just type it in? Yes, it's Mrs. Dot Trafford. Mrs. Dot Trafford. Ah, got that. At CHS. CHS? Yeah, so that's at CHS. Yes, I've got that. Yeah, online. Online, yep. Dot org dot uk. Org dot uk. Let's send that and see what happens. In the meantime, I'll talk, continue to talk to you. So what has to happen is everyone has to know that there's a new king or a new queen. And so what happens is that people like me, we dress up in, in our fancy clothes. We go with trumpeters um, into the centre of the town and we then stand up uh, on a great tower and the trumpeters blow the trumpets and then we say, um, we read out a proclamation that the Queen has sadly passed away and that her son Charles is now King Charles the um, Third. So we do that. And in Scotland, we do that in the centre of the town. We then march with soldiers up to the big Edinburgh Castle. I don't know if you know anything about Edinburgh. It has a very large castle that just sits on a great rock. And so we go up to that and we do the same thing again. We, we proclaim the um, uh, accession of the king um, and uh, that's the beginning of the, the ceremonies. Now, at that point, the queen is still in Balmoral. Aha. Now, can we see that? I'm seeing that. Can you see it? Should everyone see this? Okay, so this is the one we want. I can if see you it. Go back, this is Trafford to the first one yeah. with everybody marching in the street. That was the first one you showed us. This one? The very first one that says, um, what does it say? It says, I'm trying to think of it, get its name. Um, procession uh, to Market Cross? Yes, Procession to Market Cross. Okay, here we are. This is it. Right. So, boys and girls, that, that is the royal. These are all real soldiers. This is not um, not something ceremonial. These are real soldiers with real guns and they escort us. That's me there and one of my colleagues at the back. Now, oh, you can see I'm wearing the same red tunic that you can see that I've got on. But over the over the top of that is what's called a tabard. And that is from the days when um, people wore armor and you couldn't see their faces because the helmet covered their face to protect them from bows and arrows and, 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 uh, and uh, musket balls. And so what they did was they wore over all of that uh, a piece of cloth which had their coat of arms on it. And the coat of arms is like a logo. It, it's, it's like a, a, a trademark that basically says, this is who I am. So you would know by looking at it that it had, you know, a green, a green dragon, a, a red lion, and you would then know who that person was because you couldn't look it up. They, they, they were scrolls. There were eventually books that told you whose logo, whose arms it was. So that's us marching with the soldiers. Um, the next one's called the Lord Provost Procession, Mrs. Trafford. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's three cheers. 
You got the one before? The one from um, the session? There you go. That's it. Now, that's us that there. So that's all my my men, as it were, um, in a line. And in front of us, these men in the, the top hats, those are officials of the city of Edinburgh. They, they, they are um, uh, men who work for the, um, the provost, the mayor, whatever you would call him. And there's us. And then behind you, do you see the big sword? That is the sword of the city of Edinburgh and says that the Lord Provost, uh, the mayor, whatever you want to call him, the, the, the governor of Edinburgh's city is there. Wherever he goes, the big sword goes with him. And so from here, we are marching. And you can just imagine a long hill, you know, it's almost a mile long. And that will take us up to the castle. And you can see the police officers, as I told you, lots of police, lots of barriers. And this is the general public at the site. Um, so, Mrs. Trafford, can we have three cheers? Yes. Hip, hip. No, could we have the picture? Oh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right, it's been a long week, sir. I know it. The one, one called three cheers. Three cheers. I'll find it. I'll find it. It should be at the beginning. Okay. I'll explain all these see. other photographs in due course. Here we go. There we are. There we are. Now, <laughs> remember I was telling you that, that the proclamation is made say, from the top of a large tower. Well, this is the man with the white feathers is my boss. That is Dr. Morrow, who is the Lord Lion, King of Arms, so the chief herald of Scotland. And with him is my colleague, Adam Bruce who is a descendant of the Scottish King, Robert the Bruce. If any of you have ever seen the films like Braveheart, um, King Robert the Bruce is the one that defeated the English eventually uh, at the Battle of Bannockburn. Well, Adam Bruce is a descendant of that very king. And so they've just proclaimed King Charles to be king and they've called for three cheers. And so that's them with their feathered hats shouting hurrah and from that so that is the the first act that uh, happened um now then we get to the ceremony itself now as i said the um royal family obviously have lost a mother and a grandmother so when we the, the the event in London had to be huge, I'm afraid it has to be an enormous event. And um, but in Scotland, what we decided we would do is um, try and have a ceremony that involved the royal family. Could you manage escort to the Crown of Scotland? Before that, or you know, to say it's that's it now. Now, um, you, you need to use your imagination here now, uh, troops. What we decided we would do is that is the Queen's coffin, it was set up in the middle of the church uh, on a, a, a stand uh, called a catafalque and draped with the royal standard. Now, you can see me there looking somewhat grim and in the middle is a man called the duke of hamilton and he is carrying the scottish royal crown now that crown is the oldest part of the british crown jewels everything else that if you watch the coronation uh, on the 6th of May, all of the things you see there were made after 1660. And that is because you may or may not have heard of the um, of Oliver Cromwell, but in the uh, 1640, that's the date onwards, um, the then king, who believe it or not was Charles, 
the first, so there's a link here, King Charles fell out with the people and there was a rebellion and a general called General Oliver Cromwell forced out the royal family and he sold every single part of the royal collect all the jewels all the crowns everything were sold and melted down and turned into necklaces and <laughs> earrings whatever um when oliver cromwell came to scotland the scottish crown had been hidden we hid it um very far into the north of scotland a very very remote place just a very few people knew it was put in a box and dug into the ground. And so Oliver Cromwell couldn't find it. So when the royal family was restored in 1660, they had to have crowns and all the pretty jewellery remade, brand new. But this crown was then dug up from the ground. Now the Scottish royal crown contains gold that was um, used for the crown of Robert the Bruce. And as I told you, you saw the, the man up with the black feathered hat, that's Adam Bruce, and he is a, a descendant of the king that wore some of the gold in that crown. The crown was then remodeled and made much fancier with jewels and things like that in um, 1540. So that crown dates from perhaps as early as 1314, but certainly was in existence in 1540. So it's by, you know, over 120 years or so, um, the uh, oldest crown. Now, there's a point to this story. No king or queen of Great Britain has ever worn that crown in the sense of putting it on their head. The crown is kept in the castle and what happens is that for certain ceremonies like the opening of the, the Scottish Parliament, the crown is processed just as you see it now. The Duke of Hamilton with heralds like me and, and that's my colleague Liam and the crown is brought to represent the sovereign to represent the, the monarch, but it's not put on anyone's head. So when the committee that was devising how we would honour the Queen for the um, time she'd be in Scotland, which was, was four days altogether, we decided that it would be an act of, of, of devotion and I think something the Queen would appreciate it, that we would place the crown on the coffin at the head. In other words, where inside the box the Queen was lying. And so her Scottish crown would, for two days, be on her head in a symbolic way. And so that's what, that's this part of the ceremony. Um, so the, the crown is about to be put on the head uh, of the coffin and stayed there while people came through the church, um, thousands and thousands of them, to um, say farewell to the Queen. Um, can you manage His Majesty the King leaves St Giles, Mrs Trafford? Right, so um, this is the end of the ceremony you saw, where everyone was, um, where we put the crown on the Queen's head. And you'll see that there are the, the officers, the heralds, um, in their ceremonial uniform. There in the middle is King Charles, wearing the uniform of a general, in fact a field marshal, the highest military rank. And do you see the green sash he's wearing? That is the sash of the Order of the Thistle. And the Knights of the Thistle are the highest order of of knights that you can that there is in Scotland. Beside the king is the queen consort Camilla and behind her in the naval uniform is Princess Anne, the
the Queen's daughter. And again, you'll see she's wearing the same green sash of the Order uh, of the Thistle. And do you see in the very bottom left hand corner the chap in the red tunic? Now that is the garrison sergeant major, and he is the chief um, soldier uh, in the garrison, and it's his job to teach everyone how to march and stand in line. So I can assure you that for two days leading up to the ceremony you see, uh, the garrison sergeant major did a lot of shouting and stamping of feet and telling us to keep it a straight line and look forward and don't look at the ground because um, that's what sergeant majors do. They, they drill people and get them to do what they are supposed to do. As So whenever you see soldiers doing all these, you know, marching about looking very precise, because that's because people like the sergeant major spend hours making them do it over and over again until they're doing it as the sergeant major wants. And you can see he's saluting the king. Um, so, so this was basically the first outing of the new king with his new queen uh, and obviously his sister. The first outing in Scotland um, after the death of his mother. But, but understand, he is now the king. Even though the, the, you know, he hasn't yet got a crown put on his head, he becomes king the instant his mum passed away. It's the queen is dead, long live the king. Now, what then happened was at the end of these ceremonies, as I say, the, the queen's coffin lay for two days uh, in Scotland. It was then taken by Aeroplane to London. And I'm going to move now to, to tell you about what happened uh, in London. Um, can you manage uh, Westminster Hall lying in state? You see that, Mrs. Trafford? No, Westminster Hall lying in state. We're going to get to all these pictures in due course. That's just inside the Abbey, but that's it. Thank you. Now, what happened then is the British Parliament meets in what was once a royal palace. It's called the Palace of Westminster. You may have seen, don't know if you've ever seen Big Ben, the great big tower that has the huge clock that if you ever listen to the, the British radio, um, the uh, hours are struck by this huge clock bell that goes bong, bong, like that. Now, Inside the palace, there are the areas, the offices and things where the, the um, parliamentarians work, but they have this great hall they can use for functions, which is called Westminster Hall. And so the Queen, basically, you'll see the um, various... Now, the heralds, you notice there's now a lot more of us. That's because the English heralds are joined up to the Scottish heralds. Now, this is the first time, um, because of the importance, how, how dear the Queen was to everyone, it's the first time we've ever turned out everyone together. Normally, Scottish heralds do Scottish things, English heralds do English things. So that's the largest number of heralds ever assembled in one place, um, at least up until then. Now, you'll see there's other people in the picture, you see you see the choir, and do you see the young men in the red uniforms? Now that's those are the um, choir of the Chapel Royal. So they, these young boys, sing in the Queen's private or the King's private chapel for private ceremonies, um, and like a royal baptism. You know, baptize maybe these boys sing there. The choir in the white outfits, that is the choir of Westminster Abbey, um, who sing in the church. The people behind, those are members of parliament. Those are people who govern and control this country. Um, and you see there are lady MPs, men MPs. 
and the Queen's coffin is right in the centre. Now, I, I, I don't know, Mrs. Trafford, does this have a, a sort of kind of zoomy? Is there anything? Can we make it bigger? At all? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, just to deal with the rest of the people, you see that you'll see a man in a black robe with a big gold border down the side. That is the speaker. That's the person who controls the um, British Parliament when they're speaking. So like a teacher, he sits in a big chair in the debate, the room where all the MPs come and debate. And he is the one that tells them, you, you, if you ever watch it, you'll hear he shouts, order, order. That means be quiet. Um, beside him in the same robe is the Lord Speaker. And he does the same job. He's the, the chairman of the second chamber. In some of your countries, it might be called the Senate. But in UK, it's the House of Lords. But basically, it's another piece of parliament. So parliament itself, the government consists of the House of Commons, the mem what we call members of parliament, and the House of Lords, who people would call Lord this, Lord that. Okay, So the two chairmen are there, and you'll see very fierce looking lady, and that is a lady with a sword in a black outfit. And her title is Black Rod. And she's in charge of all the security, um, all the police officers, everyone who looks after the um, Palace of Westminster and the House of Commons. So she's a very important lady. Very often um, they've been very senior police officers or generals or admirals. So they're all people who've had a first, an earlier career, but who know a lot about organization and security. Now, what I want you to notice in particular is the Queen's coffin. Now, you remember I said in Scotland, what we did was we put the crown at the head of the coffin where the Queen's head would be, if you imagine it. In England, you'll see the crown is much, much grander. It's much, much larger. It is covered in hundreds of diamonds and rubies and sapphires. So it's not on the Queen's head. It's bolted <laughs> for security reasons. It's bolted to the coffin so that no one can run up and, and steal it. Um, but that is one of the great state, that's what they call the crown jewels. When you hear people talking about going to London to go and see the crown jewels, it's things like that. Massive diamonds, um, you know, they, they shine. Absolutely spectacular. The Scottish crown we saw is much more, um, I think, more intimate, more friendly, um, still very pretty. But this says empire. This says, I am the king, and don't you forget it, if <laughs> you see what I mean. So the Queen's body then rested in um, this hall, because it's very big, and that allowed, I, I really can't remember, I think three or four hundred thousand people. The queues went on for days, and the queues were 20 hours. They allowed 20 hours in every day, only shut for four to allow, you know, cleaning and things. So vast numbers of people were able to, to, to come from um, the, uh, all over the world, all over the world to see all of this. So the Queen stayed in this building, um, as I say, for three days. And at the end of that time, there was the funeral service itself. So, Mrs. Trafford, I'm so grateful to you for doing all this. Can you manage the one that says Westminster Abbey reception of the Queen? Yep, that's it. Thank you. 
we are now in Westminster Abbey. And as you can see, absolutely full of people. Um, and up on the, the screen, you can see there, you can see the red tunics. Those are the trumpeters of the uh, Brigade of Guard soldiers, but who play trumpets. And again, you'll see the heralds. And we are waiting. So we've marched in. We are now, we turn round and we are waiting for the Queen to be carried in by other soldiers. And so at that point, you know, say the Queen's um, uh, funeral has started, the real funeral. And so from there, we imagine, you can imagine all of us turning round and leading the Queen's coffin right in to the middle of the Abbey. And if we could have Westminster Abbey. Thank you. So that's a bit of a close up. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, there's, there's me in the middle. Um, you'd be surprised how many photographs of me in the middle. <laughs> I like to see me in the middle. So, so as you can see, we're in the coffin. The other thing you should notice is when you saw um, us in Edinburgh, you'll notice the big bright tabards. We weren't wearing black sashes. The black sashes are to represent mourning, to represent you know sadness, but they are an English tradition, not a Scottish tradition. But because we were all uniting for the very first time, or at least certainly for, for centuries as a group, it was agreed that we would wear the same sashes, black sashes, as the English. So in that picture, th there are three Scottish heralds. There's, that's my colleague. Um, he's called Unicorn. And there's me, and I'm called Carrick. And there is Adam Bruce, you see, the descendant of Robert the Bruce, the king, and he his title is Marchmont. Then behind that is an English uh, herald. And if you look, you'll see there are some differences. Um, you'll see, for one thing, our sticks are black sticks with just uh, a gold end. You'll see, if you look carefully, his stick is shorter and has a, a, an elaborate golden top, an elaborate golden top that we don't have. So all of our sticks are the same. In England, each herald has a different design of stick so that you know that who they are. Um, and at this point, we are leading out. We're now going out the way. And again, you'll see behind us, um, you know, you can see at least one general with his medals um, and the congregation. So the Queen's coffin moves out from um, the Westminster Abbey. Obviously, there's been music, prayers, um, readings from, from religious works. Um, but the service is now over. But then comes perhaps the greatest part of the event, which is the public display. Um, and the procession of the uh, Queen's Coffin all the way from the Abbey through central London, past Buckingham Palace. So if, if we could manage um, passing the Cenotaph. Oops. That's us back to waiting being in there. There we are. Now, so that is two more of my colleagues. And we are now in central London. We are marching through the area that's thought of as, as, as the centre of government. It's where there are lots of civil servants, departments, department of war, department of, of trade. And we are marching along. And at this point, we're passing what's called the cenotaph. That's a difficult word, but it, it means empty tomb. And it's a memorial, a monument to all those who've fallen in, in, in wars, uh, fighting as soldiers 
uh, for uh, Great Britain. And so we're marching on then. Um, and then we need, can you do March to Wellington Arch? There we are. Now, so this is the Queen's procession. The um, red tunics, these are all members of the Brigade of Guards. These are the military regiments, the Scots Guards, the Welsh Guards, Coldstream Guards, um, who guard the Queen. That is their principal job, and they wear these very um, impressive scarlet uniforms. You'll see the very big hats. The, these are um, made out of, of, of bear skin. Um, and the reason the hats are very tall is because it makes the soldiers look even taller than they are. So these soldiers are all, you know, at least five foot ten, something like that. But they wear these hats, which makes them six foot five. Um, so it, it's, it's for sure. The man with the hat with the white feathers is the general who commands all the Queen's guards. So this is the very front of the procession. He is leading it because he is the commander of the Queen's guards. This, the heralds are coming and behind that is a band and behind the band is the Queen's coffin. Now, does anybody know how the Queen's coffin is being taken through the streets? Do you think it's in a, 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 a car? Alison, do you know? I actually, I actually watched the procession because it was uh, was filmed lively. I think it was held by like it was held up by human hands. Correct. It was being pulled by sailors. So the Queen's coffin was put onto a gun carriage, the kind of the big wheels, which uh, obviously don't we don't use anymore. Um, you know. Uh, cannons and things are much more but are modern but this is a big green gun carriage with a coffin on it and then hundreds of sailors because it's very heavy the the um, gun carriage and coffin weigh over two tons so ropes are attached and two entire um, divisions of sailors from two separate ships literally pulled with muscle power the coffin all the way through central London and we reached as we're going along here um so can if you well, I need you to imagine there are five different bands so the the music they're all playing the same tunes same tunes but the noise the the, the amount of music is filling the air but the crowds, and there were hundreds of thousands of people, were silent. There was not a sound coming from the crowd. There was so much respect for the late Queen that they didn't cheer or, or clap. They just watched and showed respect for the um, passing of the coffin. But they did it in, in silence. And last, not last one, but can you manage Wellington Arch? Nope. Oh, sorry. There's that handsome devil again. This one's called Wellington Arch. Maybe right. it's a different. Okay. And name. Uh, well, did we do March to Wellington Arch? Did we? We might not have. Let me have yes, a look. Let's have a look at that then. Very similar, but nope. Let's see, silly men. There you go. There we are. So I wanted this to go again. This is the same. I want, but it's a close up. So now you can see the general with his um, hat. Th those feathers are from swans. They are swans feathers. And I am reliably informed no swans are harmed. 
<laughs> the feathers are harvested um, as they, they fall off and the, the swans get to swim away. But can you also see the band in the back? Um, so as I say, there were five bands all together um, marching at different So this is the very end of the procession. The bands have stopped now. They've formed up. And at this point, the Queen's coffin is about to reach the final part of its journey with the sailors. And at this point, the coffin is transferred from the um, sailors pulling it on the gun carriage into a modern hearse to drive to um, Windsor. Do, do we all, all know where the, what Windsor is? Windsor is a great castle, great medieval castle. It looks like something from the time of, of knights in shining armour. Huge castle, which is outside London. And can you manage Lord Lion and Garter King of Arms at Windsor? It's always the last one. Oh, for a century. Ah, thank you. Now, this is the final part of the ceremonies. All the noisy public affair has finished, military bands, cheating crowds. This is the chapel at Windsor Castle where the Queen and other members of the royal family actually lived, where, where they had their eyes, with their television sets. This was their home. And you'll see now there aren't all these soldiers and even the heralds have come down to two. And that is my boss, the uh, Lord Lion King of Arms, and in front of him, um, the Garter King of Arms, and I'll explain that in a minute, the Garter King of Arms, who's the head of the English system of heralds, and just one guardsman, one officer there in the red tunic. Now, now we see the royal family assembled. So we have the king in the naval uniform. Beside him, the queen consort, Camilla. Beside her, Princess Anne in the uniform of an, an admiral, a lady's uniform of an admiral. Her husband, who is uh, an admiral himself. Then we have the Earl of Wessex, Prince Edward, the Queen's youngest son, and his wife and his two children. So the main, the closest members of the royal family are right there. The Queen's coffin is just out of the picture. So this is almost a private ceremony. There's still a lot of people. But this is the last farewell to the Queen by the state and by the people. It's become much smaller. The royal family, instead of being surrounded by presidents and prime ministers of France and all of these other things, it's now just them and a small number of officials. And at this point, the Queen's coffin is in the chapel of her home. So this is much more like the funeral you would have for a grandpa or a granddad, you know, near their home with the family around them. And the very final act in the um, funeral, all of these people are gone, all of them. And it's just the royal family who will have watched the Queen's coffin lowered down under the floor of that um, of the chapel, you see the black and white uh, tiles under that floor, um, and the queen's coffin was laid there alongside that of her husband, Prince Philip, who, of course, as you know, died uh, the year before. And that ceremony is exactly like one that any family would experience 
just the family and obviously some official of the the, the church um, blessing the queen and laying her to rest beside her husband. So as you can see now, for people as important as the, the queen, but also, you know, presidents and prime ministers in, in other countries, um, the, the people want to be able to say goodbye. The people want to be able to take part in the ceremonies. So there have to be all these great ceremonies, but ultimately it has to end with the children saying goodbye, mum, goodbye, granny, goodbye, great granny, just like any other family. So the, the story of the Queen's death starts with, with her in her Scottish holiday home. She passes uh, peacefully because she's very old. And then all of these ceremonies say, we loved you, we revered you, you did a very good job as queen. But at the very end, we have the family, royal family, but still the family, who get to see the last act. Coffin goes into the ground, is covered over, and you say goodbye. So these ceremonies will probably never, ever be seen again. The um, effort that went into the Queen's funeral um, was a result of years of planning. The resources were available. Um, the respect with which the president, bear in mind she was Queen for over 60 years, no president, no prime minister anywhere in the world has been in charge of a country for that enormous length of time. So everyone came, President Biden came, the presidents of France, um, Germany, um, everywhere in Europe, Canada, um, the, the, the um, king of, the emperor of Japan came personally. Um, so the outpouring of love for the Queen was, I think, something it would be hard to match. There will obviously be grand funerals again, but to take part from the very beginning, I was with the Queen's coffin more or less from 24 hours after she died, all the way through, involved in all the ceremonies until the very end, when um, she was laid to rest as a granny, not a queen, none of all these things. So it's that great journey. It starts with pomp, circumstances, diamond crowns, but ultimately it ends with a sad family saying goodbye to a beloved grandmother uh, and great grandmother. So that is my story. Um, but I'd be very happy to uh, answer any questions, if there's anything you would like to know, or if I can explain anything to you. I'm absolutely delighted to answer anyone's question, if I can. Great. I'm sure there will be some questions. By the way. Win-win. Thank you, sir. I um, it's a, it's not exactly a question, but I just wanted to tell you that um, this um, this talk is really interesting. I learned so many new stuff out of this talk, as every talk, and this is an amazing so talk. So thank you for coming, sir. Not in the slightest. Um, but there must be something somebody wants a, the, to to know that I haven't told you. Um, the 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 the, the um yes win-win so i wanted to ask you that um where does the queen's body get um buried in which grave in in the in windsor castle um which if you look up on google you'll see is this very it's very medieval looking it, it, it looks like something from the time of of of, of uh, knights in shining armor um but in fact 
bits of it are a modern home. It's like so many of these um, big state buildings. Um, they look very impressive and they look very military. But in fact, there are areas where the Queen would sit in a sitting room, probably just like one you've got at home, and watch the television and have a cup of tea. And in that building is a chapel called the Chapel of St. George. Now, as you may know, St. George is the patron saint uh, of England. He is uh, St. George the Dragon Slayer. Um, and so the Queen is in under the floor um, in a vault. Um, it's, it's traditional for people of kings and queens and things. They don't get buried in the ground. They tend to be buried inside buildings so that their grave can be marked and people can come. Because let's face it, um, when I one day pass away, there's not going to be that many people all that interested to see where my grave is. But for many years to come, people will want to come and see where the Queen was, where Prince Philip is. You may have heard of Princess Diana, the um, present king's wife, the, the um, uh, mother of, of Prince uh, Princess William and uh, uh, Prince Harry. Now, uh, she unfortunately was killed in a car crash, um, but her grave is at her old home um, where she, she lived, a big house where she lived, and there's a big memorial, and tens of thousands of people come every year to, to leave flowers and to, to pay respects to someone that they, they loved. So people of special importance tend to have their graves in buildings of special importance. Does that make sense to you? Yes, that totally answers my question, sir. Thank you. Yes. Anything got, else I can do? We've got Flavia. Flavia? Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so you mentioned how the moment you, you're you crowned as, you know, a ruler of a country, all these things start being planned out for you from, from the very beginning, your funeral, for example. What yes. other ceremonies are planned out straight away, you know, from the moment you are designated ruler of a country? Well, well, obviously the very first thing has to be that there has to be a public acclamation. You, you, you are the king or the queen, um, but just like the President of the United States. You know who the President is in November, but in January, there's a big ceremony where the President comes out in Washington, takes a public oath, and then there are processions through uh, Washington to wave at him. So every country has an acclamation ceremony of some kind. Now in, in, our, in, in, in Britain, it's a coronation because there's a real crown and it is put on your head. So as soon as the um, uh, Queen passed, uh, plans started for the King's coronation, which will take place on the 6th of May this year. So you can see it all has to happen quite quickly um, because it's important that the King is seen he gets his crown, everyone says hurrah, hip hip, and whatever. Um, so the world can go on. So the coronation has to be planned. But I have to be honest with you, the king's funeral is being planned. It, it, it's just the way it is. You cannot leave these things to chance. You have to make arrangements. Um, where are all the presidents and things going to go um, who want to attend a funeral? Um, if it's going to be in London, where, how will you stop the traffic? So I'm afraid the, the planning, it, it may sound quite gruesome, but um, I'm afraid the coronation, the big ceremony, the, 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 the celebration is being planned, but I'm afraid so is um, the funeral. <laughs> it, it's, it's simply the nature of being a person of, of that importance. Your life isn't truly your own. You know, you, you belong to the country. So the country has to prepare and uh, give you a good send off. There'll be a big celebration in May, but equally um, people are planning now what happens when King Charles himself passes. And of course, there'll be a great ceremony for um, uh, Prince William, whatever name he wants to take. Now there's an interesting thing that you might not know. 
kings and queens aren't always called by the name their family call them. They have what's called a regno name, and that's the name by which they intend to be known as king. So, for example, um, King Edward the Eighth was known as as Be Albert. Edward the Seventh, I should say. His name was Albert, and his mum called him Albert. But when he became king, he de he declared he would be called King Edward. Um, Edward the Eighth, um, who was the um, present queen's uncle was called David. And he thought King David sounded just a little bit too biblical. King David was the father of King Solomon, if you remember, in your Bible. Um, and he thought King David didn't work. So he called himself Edward as well. And King Charles didn't need to be King Charles. He might have decided that, that um, he wanted to be called something else. So a king or a queen gets to call themselves, their title as king, gets to be whatever they want to be. So, um, so we don't know what Prince William will call himself when he decides um, to be, uh, well, well, not when he decides, when he becomes the king. Um, th th that's just the way it is. It um, might be that King Billy is a bit of a controversial um, <laughs> a reminder of the past. Darling, it depends where you are, Mrs. Trafford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm south of the border now. This <laughs> neck of the woods, um, King Billy is <laughs> well revered. But of course, you see, this is always a difficulty. It's the historical connections. Uh, some people thought that King Charles wouldn't want to be King Charles because King Charles I was the only uh, king uh, to be beheaded. I mean, he was killed by Oliver Cromwell. So you might think it was an unlucky name. Um, but there is no requirement to take the name of um, what your family called you. And th there's another argument for that too, which is that what your family call you is intimate, if you see what I mean. Um, and maybe it's quite nice that your public face is, is King George, but your family call you Charlie. Um, and so it, it maybe creates a slight difference between when you're on the job and when you're at home watching the telly. Because I assure you, members of the royal family do just sit at home sometimes with a bowl of spaghetti and watch the telly. I mean, they have ordinary lives as well. I, I don't think you could cope with the pressures of being constantly... I mean, as soon as a member of the royal family steps out the door, someone takes a photograph of them. So I think sometimes they need to just have domesticity, you know, an ordinary home. Um, and so perhaps that's an argument for taking another name um, rather than the name that the family call you at, uh, at home. And, for example, Queen Elizabeth herself, um, it wasn't a different name. But her family called her Lilibet because when she was little, she couldn't pronounce Elizabeth. Name was too hard. And the first attempt at her name, she came out with Lilibet and it stuck. So her mother called her Lilibet, etc. Um, so again, she at least had a domestic name. And you may have noticed um, that's the, the, the name is the name that uh, the, the um, Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, uh, has given to her daughter um, as a mark of respect, but also to be something different. She didn't want to just call her Elizabeth. So she's actually used the name Lily Bet um, uh, as a name for her daughter. So, you know, there we are. Anything else you'd like to know? There's one, probably time for one quick question. Our head boy's over in Canada. I'm not sure if he's still here, he's disappeared, but he's wondering what led you to being appointed to the role of Herald. Aha. Uh -huh. Why, why um, you? Knowing, ah, uh, well, <laughs> I, fit, I could fit in the uniform. You see, that's how they do it. They say, try that uniform on. If it fits, you can have the job. No, I mean, basically, like many of these things, I, I'm a lawyer. I mean, that is what I am by, by training and calling. Um, heraldry 
which is what heralds are all about, is actually quite scientific. Um, it's about looking into people's families, deciding whether, you know, who should be the rightful, uh, you know, duke of something. Um, and when I was a small child, my mother, uh, who was very fond of knights in shining armor and that sort of thing, used to take me to visit castles and houses. And the one thing I began to notice was that often there were shields on the wall as, you know, decoration. And there'd be a red dragon or a green lion or whatever. And then I started to notice that when you went to another castle, there was a similar shield with a similar red lion, but maybe slightly different. And so after a while, my mother gave me a book. And from that, I realized that what happens in a family is if you're all of the same family descent, the um, red lion is the shield of the, the, the main member of the family. If his brother wanted to go out you know, and fight, he would have the red lion, perhaps with a black border round his shield, so that people knew he was from the family who had the red lion, but that he was someone slightly different. He was a, a, a brother, a cousin. So I began to see that there was a pattern that, that heraldry repeats itself, has patterns, has um, uh, connection. And so I became interested. Now, how do you get this job is very, very simple. Um, you make yourself um, aware of where these people are. I simply um, wrote a letter saying, um, I'd be quite interested in doing this job. It's, it's obviously a, a part-time job. You don't get paid. To do it, um, but I'd be interested. And then this, so the then chief herald came and said, "Come and have a chat." So I had a chat, and uh, he said, "Fine, well, when the next time there's a vacancy, we'll let you know." Because that's the only trouble. It's a small unit. You can't be made one unless there's a vacancy. If you see what I mean. So when I retire, that will make space for someone else. You know. Whereas in my day job as a judge. Um, obviously, it's entirely different. You're paid, so you're, you 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 go before a selection board. You 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 know you have a a recruitment process, and if they need more judges, they can recruit more judges. <laughs> Whereas with heralds, it's there's a fixed number, and it's one in, one out. The other thing I will make clear to you, because I see all you ladies there, um, until. Not so long ago, it was a job for a man. That's been completely blown out. In Scotland, we have two Lady Heralds and England has one. So it's another breakthrough for the ladies um, that uh, they can have these jobs as well. Um, and quite rightly so. Um, there, there is no reason why uh, women shouldn't, shouldn't do these jobs. But as I say, to, just so I'm clear, traditionally it was a man's job, um, and it's really only in the last ten years or so um, that that has been that glass ceiling or glass shield <laughs> has been broken through. So I'm, I'm sorry this is all a bit disjointed because it's it's difficult. I, I'm truncating twelve days into an hour. So obviously um, it is a snapshot, but I hope that you enjoy it. What you can do now, of course, is the funeral and all of these things are on YouTube. You can now perhaps go back and have a look at some of it and you'll have some idea. I mean, at some point you say, hey, look, there's George. Um, <laughs> so it, it might perhaps put a little bit of context. But, but what you need to go away with in thinking is that, remember that for people who have these great public jobs, they, they are, some, to some extent, prisoners of the jobs they do. They, they, they don't get to be themselves all the time. So for even someone as popular as the Queen, her funeral ceremonies, if you like, were hijacked, too strong a word, but they were taken over by the state by the people. So much of what we saw was an outpouring of, of state sentiment of, of the people and the government 
the very end, a granny was being interred with the family that she loved. So it's a journey from being queen to ultimately being granny and great granny and being able to have the private time. So I hope that's been of some interest to you. And uh, I, um, as I say, go and have a look again. It's, I see, YouTube, whatever, have a look again and maybe you'll see a bit more um, of what was happening and have a better understanding of how these great ceremonies are put together. But just remember this, it's like a duck. You see the duck on the water and it looks as if it's gliding, but its wee legs are going, you know, 10 to the dozen. Likewise, for all these events, hundreds and hundreds of people who you didn't see did a vast amount of work in order to make it look as simple, seamless as it was. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Mrs. Trafford, thank you for being my, my uh, photo um, shop assistant. Um, I will try better to learn how to use this system for, for another day. And uh, wherever you are, stay safe. And just remember, you're sticking at school, okay? Because if not, you might end up having to be a herald full-time or something, and they'll pay you. It's a great deal. So sticking at school and enjoy yourselves and, and goodbye to everyone. They certainly will. You'll see a lot of hands clapping now. You might not hear them, but lots of no, love no, hearts no. are flying very, up. Well, as I say, thank you very, very much indeed. And you all stay safe wherever you are. God bless. Thank you, Bye. sir. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank Amazing you. Talk. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Mrs. For Trafford, I already, Goodbye, everyone. Um, I already um redeemed the merits, by the way, and um oh, the survey. Okay, thank you. Bye, bye. bye. Right. Night, night. Have bye -bye. a nice tea. Take care. Night, night. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye.